This is the ZMAR Podcast. Elite Benefits of America helps small and mid-sized companies with their health insurance programs. And now, your host, Butch ZMAR. So as we move into the fourth quarter, these businesses have to make their changes, right? They're the new routines, right? And, and I would say adapt new routines. Uh, the traditional routine is when the renewal came in, we have two weeks to make a decision, and then we have to tell our employees, hey, this is what's going on. Uh, most cases, hey, your premiums are going up by a certain percentage. They present those in some capacity, and then they have to rush to do enrollment. We, I know benefit firms that are large, much larger than I am, but um, mid, mid-sized companies uh, that they do their benefit package so late in the game in December, and it could be because they're busy, but um, but most employers do this. And uh, so come January 1st, they don't have insurance cards yet. So they switch in carriers or switch products, or maybe the, it's the same exact health plans, but uh, a family decides they're going to move to a different health plan for that year. They got to wait for the new insurance card. And it's always somebody's luck, dumb luck, that um, they have an emergency room visit or somebody gets sick the weekend of uh, January 1st and they don't have anything. So change the routine. I've talked to at least half of my clients for the January renewals already. If you have not touched base with your current broker, uh, shame on them. But um, I, I would reach out to them and see what opportunities you are. Unfortunately, some of the smaller groups, they don't really have much of an option, but, um, but even like yesterday, um, I, or this week rather, so it was a couple days ago, I took a, a quick visit to one of the clients. They were one employee on, on the plan, just one. And I stopped by, um, it was on a way to another meeting and I stopped by and there was not a whole lot they could do, but at least I made the touch. Um, they weren't looking to make any changes. Um, they just said, okay, all right, well, at least I know what, what the impact's going to be. But I already gave them the expectations early on of what, what we're seeing throughout the year. So even just for one employee, and it's hard to do that because there's not enough revenue, but but it's just about the touches. I was on my way anyways. It didn't cost me anything to pull in a parking lot, walk in the door, say hi to them, and then drop off the renewal, have a 10-minute conversation with them, and out uh, on a way I go. And let's talk about some of these new routines that you should do. So the first thing I think you need to do for a new routine is look at technology. There's so many small, mid-sized companies out there not embracing technology. I tell you, it's a pain in the butt to get started, but I tell you, once it's, once it's there, it makes everything so much smoother, not only for us as the broker, but as the employer. New hires, terminations, um, the list goes on. Uh, it'll save you time and time over and over again. On one of the episodes, in the past episodes, we did a cost analysis, how many hours that's going to save HR, and even if you had multiple HR or office managers to handle this, how much time that, and I, I still think I'm going by memory, but it was going to save you like $20,000 a year on bigger companies. On smaller companies, it could be $2,000 um, worth of wages and time. And then also look at payroll integration. I know a lot of small and mid-sized companies. We have employers um, that have 100 employees and they're still using Intuit. No no offense to Intuit, but I tell you, it's a small business product and it's a good uh, segue to actually get up and running. Um, makes it super simple, but I tell you, when you get to a certain point, they don't integrate. Um, they're starting to compete with us. They're trying to roll in benefits because that's what the uh, competitor payroll companies are doing. And we're going to talk about that um, because I got a case, uh, small case study of what happened in the last couple of weeks on uh, payroll company trying to do benefits. But so payroll integration, because now if the systems communicate with each other, you don't have to have multiple systems for onboarding or termination. Uh, you could have an employee log into a system. In fact, we have one system that it's only one login. That's it. And so um, other systems are two logins, but they communicate with each other. So if you terminate in the benefits, it terminates in payroll. If you terminate in payroll, it terminates the benefits. So if you do onboarding on one end, it sends a feed to another. Um, so like if you do payroll and agree, um, do the payroll setup and enter the employee, it does actually set up the account to a certain degree with the benefit side, but they don't enroll in benefits. They're going to have to log in and do that. But but at least they communicate and save you a little bit of time so you don't have to go to five different places to terminate. I tell you, if you offer a medical plan, a dental, a vision, a life insurance, maybe even a short-term disability, and let's just say they're all with different companies, well, that's five terminations or five onboarding processes you have to make. So streamline it will just save you time. It'll free up uh, a whole bunch of other stuff. I'm telling you, start now. I would say move your employees to the technology now. So outside the renewal, you have now 
well, set up the technology now. And that way, when we go to open enrollment, um, everything will be set up and then they'll all get login and passwords and they can all do it online. And then we can see who hasn't filled it out. And so, whereas, uh, when you do paper, sure, you have to count all the paper, you have to do a tally, you have to probably make an inventory list of all the employees that turned it in or didn't turn it in. And then not only that, you have to make sure that the forms are all completed correctly. Whereas if you do technology, it's already there. So uh, medical renewals are definitely dreadful. So um, when when the renewal comes out, and I, um, if this is the first time you're hearing it, medical renewals hit the hit the streets for January 1st, sometime in October, usually late October. So there's an excuse of waiting until December to, to visit the renewal, both on the broker side and the employer side. Uh, I feel like it's hogwash. Um, small employers, especially under 25 employees, should have that knocked out by mid-November. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe even November 1st, you shouldn't be ready to rock and roll. Yeah, it's two months out, but I'm telling you, just get it done. Do the open enrollment in November, head into the holiday seasons when they have their new insurance cards in their pocket for January 1st. Just going to make things a lot easier for everybody. But traditionally what happens is the broker throws the renewal at you maybe 30 days out. Uh, in some cases, because there's uh, a big insurance company in the state of Illinois that has certain restrictions on making plan changes and they have a window, you can do it. Uh, they're the only ones that do it. They're horrible um, at, at that process. But if it's not within that window, then you can't make any changes. So it kind of forces you to do the renewal and get stuck with the same plans, which in a lot of cases, a lot of employers don't want to make any changes. Too many changes for the employees change, uh, makes vulnerability with the employee base and then it creates turnover. So they don't want to change plans all the time or even every couple of years. It just changes too much. So the increases are there. There's no resolution. Typically, we complain in a room that healthcare costs so much. And there's many reasons behind it. Everybody combats the wrong reasons. Uh, and we can discuss those on different podcasts. And I've talked about it on previous podcasts. Sometimes, uh, uh, especially on dental and vision and sometimes life insurance products, if there's increases, the broker could go back and negotiate, kind of earn their commissions, and then they get uh, 3% savings. Sometimes on the medical side, you could do that too, based on claim history. But it's it's definitely a challenge and the, uh, the agent looks like a hero because they save 3%. But you know we don't know if we're right on the, uh, on the right platform. There's a lot of loyalty with insurance brokers out there. Uh, the average age is over 60. Some of them are old school and they won't look at other opportunities or other programs that might be able to work. Affordable Care Act plans you cannot negotiate. So if you're under uh, 50 employees, most likely you're if you're on a big name insurance company, you're probably on an Affordable Care Act plan um, and they're all age rated to some degree. They may do composite. They blend the ages together, but those are the rates based on the age. There's nothing we can do. And so a lot of the increases each year are based on an age. Everybody ages up every year. So if you got a 10% uh, increase, well, everybody just got older in your employee base. And so you have to take that in consideration. There's no negotiations with Affordable Care Act plans. The sooner that you can move away from Affordable Care Act plan or a traditional plan, so even if you're on a grandfather plan, the better. You have more control there, uh, sure, if you want somebody else to take care of everything, then stay on an Affordable Care Act plan, pay the higher money. Don't see any of the details uh, because they're hiding everything from you. Administrative fees, our commissions are now being disclosed. And so uh, that's out of the puzzle now. But all the administrative fees, the profits, how much claims are being done on an Affordable Care Act plan, they don't have to send it to you. In certain situations when you're big enough, you could actually put a formal request. It takes a long time and they're not willing to actually give it. So you're going to have to go jump through hoops for it. But the sooner you get off the Affordable Care Act plan, the better. You have more control. You could actually get a monthly report about claims. You're not going to see employee bases on this, but you're actually going to see where the claims are going. Pharmacy claims, doctor visit claims, emergency room visits. We could combat those by doing education to the employee base. We could print out flyers from an HR source that we provide to our clients to help them get a little education on, hey, don't go to the ER unless you really have to. And sometimes it's challenging um, because people are in pain or something happened and you're not sure if something's broken. And so you really have to use some good judgment before you go run in the ER, but we can educate them on. They think that's the only rite of passage to get healthcare when something happens suddenly. It's not. You can go to urgent care. And I tell you, if something's bad enough, urgent care is going to call an ambulance and get you to the hospital anyways. And so it's not like 
You're not going to get access to quality care. In fact, in some cases, if you do the right homework and put together the right employee benefit plan, so you need to provide enough time to do this, but you could actually put together and get access to better health care and, and may not be the guy, uh, guy down the street or the hospital down the street. And just because they have a big name in Chicago doesn't mean that they're the best quality facility to actually go to for what you're looking for. Um, it might be shocking to you, but I tell you, the devils are in the details and uh, marketing is promotion. And if they're promoting it and they're not doing a negative spin on it, it makes it sound like that hospital is the greatest thing in the whole wide world. But and a lot of times they pay for those um, banners and they pay for the, hey, we got voted number one heart clinic in the entire state. Well, they pay for a lot of that. So just be careful. But we can get into that on another podcast. So some negotiation can occur based on claims. So when you get a renewal or when we're talking to employer, uh, I'm sorry, for non-affordable care act plans, uh, we could possibly negotiate. If you're big enough and there's enough premium, we could go back to them and ask them if, whether it's at the renewal or new business, we could actually talk to them, to the insurance company and say, hey, what if we do X, Y, and Z? Will that lower the rate? Sure, it could be deductibles and copay raising, and that's traditional method of getting premiums lower, but you could use that as leverage and saying, hey, instead of, if I raise my deductible, the, the, the format is that we save 10%. Well, if we raise the deductible and we're paying all this premium, can you do 15%? And in some cases they will, some cases they won't, but you can negotiate more. You could implement other programs such as uh, direct primary care or zero cost urgent care or immediate care to the employees. And if you do this, um, you might be able to uh, lower your premiums because you're giving the employees a financial incentive to do something else for better outcomes. And so another thing you can do is implement those incentivized programs uh, for employees to make better decisions. So direct primary care is one. It could be zero cost facilities, surgical facilities, urgent care, immediate care. And so this is changing up your routine uh, from your normal one. Instead of just collecting the renewal and having a summary that you never read through, um, you need to dive into it to see if you could get some cost savings, especially those CFOs out there. And there was HR managers for mid-market companies, two, three, four, 500 uh, employees um, because they're, you guys are small enough still that you don't have enough bandwidth or buying power to do other products, other things. And so sometimes it's easier just to take the renewal and then you work on sales department to increase sales to cover it up. There's a lot of other ways we could do this and it's just changing your routine and how you handle the renewal. You could also imp implement a claims advocacy uh, program for your employees. This gives advice on how to navigate the system and get access to better quality care. There are tools out there to actually look at how the grading factor is for each one of the doctors. You could actually look up and see if there's pending lawsuits against certain doctors. You may be surprised with this report. And so as well as maybe... You could find out different facilities that are smaller that actually have higher ratings. They have better outcomes, faster recovery times. Um, but you won't know that while, without implementing a program. When the claims start coming in, how do they handle the claims? It can be overwhelming. So you could have an advocacy program put in place to help them handle that, maybe negotiate things or um, what an average cost is. Uh, providers will take advantage at claim time, especially the bigger claims. Uh, we had... Um, a guest on our podcast that talked about claims. He wrote a book called Never Pay the First Bill. Um, fantastic guy. He um, um, he brought up a case study that he they sued a doctor or a provider, a big hospital in Texas, because they were saying that they were supposed to be billed a certain way. His argument is saying that, no, it's not allowed. It went to court. The judge sided with the patient and... Um, in fact, uh, they eliminated the bill or something like that. You have to go back to that podcast and listen to it. But I'm just saying that providers take advantage of things to try to get more money. And there's no checks and balances because they lobby. That's why there's lawsuits tying up transparency. So you're supposed to get a menu board like McDonald's when you walk into the hospital. You know exactly what your cost is up front. But facilities are suing for that and tying it up in court because they don't want you to know. If you own a business, Elite Benefits of America wants to remind you that health insurance open enrollments are either happening now or coming very quickly. And this is the time to review and implement a health care plan to make or keep you as the employer of choice. 
Deadlines for open enrollment range between November 1st and January 1st. Get ahead of the curve. The Small Business Special Enrollment Period, part of the Affordable Care Act, now allows employers with 49 employees and under to offer health benefits without contributing a dime to the employee plan. Help your employees save money on taxes with health insurance they're already paying for with their hard-earned dollars. Butch Zemar from Elite Benefits of America wants you to reach out to him today. Visit EliteBenefits.net or call 708-535-3006. So let's talk about new routines. We just went through some of the areas that you could be do, but um, none of this is new. It's probably new for you, but none of it's new. You're not not the first one to go down the, this path. Um, so, But let's make some small changes. Um, so let's go through a checklist and let's find areas that are super easy for you to tackle right away ahead of the renewal and then into the renewal. Um, maybe you can't move away from an Affordable Care Act plan now, but you could start the process because every single year, if you keep going through the process, eventually you're going to move out of there. And then especially if you're a growing company. And then once you get into that platform, uh, yeah, there, there's still going to be increases on those plans, but we have companies that we moved to a level funded plan three or four years ago. And they're, yes, they've gotten increases every single year on the level funded. So that doesn't go away, but we're, they're still lower than the premium than they were four years ago. And so that says a lot. Um, so premiums will go up. There's, we can't stop that, but how you control it and where the benchmark is, is definitely the difference. You can look at your, um, employee pl- uh, benefits plan a little bit differently instead of just waiting two weeks before the renewal and do a quasi three day open, uh, open enrollment. It's really, um, a train wreck at that point. And so look at it just a little bit different. Uh, go figure out where you stand in all these areas that we already discussed. You go to our website, there's a scorecard on there. If you actually go to elitebenefits.net forward slash scorecard, you could actually um, fill in your own numbers. Uh, We'll have a brief conversation with no obligation, and I'll give you a report and show you where those areas that you could uh, have some improvement. Again, elitebenefits.net. It's not .com, but .net forward slash scorecard. A couple case studies here. So uh, through payroll companies, uh, we just had a situation where we had a big payroll company with this employer. We provided the benefits. Again, just because they're big doesn't mean they do it right. And so we had a payroll issue with syncing up uh, correctly with the for the um, uh, deductions for the employee. Uh, our calculations were different. Our, uh, we were using a Ben Admin system. Their, their, their calculations were um, off compared to payroll. Payroll kept saying it was us. It was this he said, she said thing. We spent several hours trying to put, uh, figure out, okay, where is the problem here? Because, you know, we're vulnerable too. There are times, and we did find actually in the Ben Avon system, something was set up incorrectly. It didn't have an impact on the payroll, but it, it helped us fix the problem. So we're, well, we're willing to fix those issues. So after spending a couple hours on it, we verified that the payroll deductions were wrong from the payroll side. And not only did we verify that, we actually put it in a spreadsheet so they can understand it and actually see the differences and why it was there. And um, and that fixed the whole issue. And so they ma- now made the adjustments after we showed it to them, but we're the ones that had to spend the time uh, versus the, the big dog thought that they were right, but they ended up being wrong. And so they adjusted, actually the premiums, um, premiums for the employees went down in that case. Um, and the employer is adjusting it from past premium. So everything's up in front there, but, um, but anyhow, there was a discrepancy and it was a big payroll company and I guess, you know, the bigger they are, how can they be wrong? Right? So, well, here's proof. And so another one is a lot of payroll companies, especially the bigger ones are actually doing benefits now. And they throw us under the bus saying that we don't do anything. It's still a self service. The employer's doing everything. And I'm telling you, it's all hogwash. You know, it's every business in the across America. It doesn't matter what industry it is. There's always going to be 10 to 20 percent of the, the people that are lazy bums in the industry. And yes, I'm not saying that insurance brokers sell a health plan and then tell the employer to do everything. That happens more than I could ever imagine. But um, I would think it's unethical for a payroll company to throw in brokers under the bus, but that's a different story. Um, it's not my battle. I just, I just move on. So what we had a company that decided to do benefits with the payroll company, they're not a PEO. So those who are listening, it wasn't a PEO, it was a separate health plan and it was managed by the payroll company and the renewal was coming up. So they actually got the invoice for the renewal. So they never saw the renewal up to this point. So they're, 
They're less than 30 days out of the new increase for the renewal. And then they email the payroll company and say, hey, can you email us the renewal? Because we never saw it. We, we have the invoice. We want to see what's going on. The payroll company just emailed and just said, here you go. It's attached. They open it up. It's a 40% increase. Uh, no resolution, no conversation, didn't even offer a meeting consultation. They just said, here you go. And when they responded, hey, you're going to shop this out, they actually said no. And so they just ghosted everything all together. Uh, and so for what they blame us for, they're doing themselves. Uh, the customer service is really a call center. Uh, they're not consultants. If you want somebody just uh, just to hold the health insurance and make it migrate with payroll, fine. But I tell you, as much healthcare is increasing, it's going to cause you a problem down the road. So we end up winning that business as a result. We're actually still in the middle of shopping because we were able to save money to begin with. But now they opened up the door and said, well, what? how much more savings can we get if we just open our minds a little bit? So we're exploring those avenues as well. It's a small, again, it's a small company, but we were able to help them and they're not even in the Midwest. So um, those across the country could still call. Another thing is look at level funded, smaller groups. So under 100 could still definitely take advantage of level funded. Some of them are 50 and under. It depends on the company. Level funded is a self-funded program, but they take the anticipated claims and divide it by 12 months and make it level so the employer is not having premiums up and down. Traditional self-funded, you'll see fluctuations in premium payment based on claims, and um, small businesses can't handle that. Small meaning under 100 uh, they just can't handle it. So, but we just did a seven employee group uh, recently for a September 1st renewal. Right now it's August, middle of August. The, the renewal is already done. Everything's done in this case. So the, the employees have already seen the plan, saw the premiums. They actually have their insurance cards in hand. And here we are, we still have two weeks before they'll actually be able to use it. So we went through underwriting, uh, found out a new rate, uh, this employer is saving $15,000 a year. So divide that by uh, seven and uh, you could do the math. And so per employee, they're still saving um, a good amount, you know, 2000 bucks. But $15,000 a year could be reallocated. In fact, the employer is actually taking it and they're buying dental and vision products. So they're 100% paid for by the employer and he's still ahead, way ahead. And so uh, it's definitely reaping some savings across the board. And even larger groups, um, the case study I always bring up because I, I really like this one because it, it went through, uh, I mean, they're under 50 employees, but there were around 42 employees in the Chicago land market went through underwriting. Um, they save $75,000 a year in, in premium. And we actually eliminated the PPO requirement. And so they can go anywhere they want and the bills would be processed as if they were already in the PPO network. So everybody uh, could at least explore this avenue. Not everybody will qualify, but when I say not everybody, it's a small, it's a minority of the uh, companies out there that may not qualify or at least start heading in the right direction. 